Welcome to Shoreline Conversations. I'm your host, Keith Kruger, and today I'm excited as we're going to tackle the the topic of getting real about our faith. And uh, we've got a special guest, probably not one that you would typically imagine for this one. As we talked about health, maybe he would have been the one you would have thought. But we are joined today by Dr. Rick Alexander. Rick, it is so glad to be here with you. So nice to have you here. And uh, I'm looking forward to a fun conversation yeah. with you. As uh, as I joked about earlier, like you are the expert when it comes to faith. And so our audience is really uh, in for a treat to, to hear from you today. Well, thanks, Keith. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here as always. And, uh, you know, when I think of my faith journey, as, as all of us do, it's intensely personal. And uh, I'm just uh, exceedingly grateful that that Jesus pursued me uh, for years, even when I wasn't pursuing him. Mm -hmm. And uh, he saw it fit that uh, that uh, I was worth saving, as he feels about everybody that doesn't yet know him. That's sweet. And I love how you, you get emotional over that, because yeah, it I really do. is a big deal. I think yeah. that's one of the things that maybe is hard when we talk about our faith, is it is so personal. And yeah. people are like, hey, don't don't get into my business. You know, that's right. between me and God. Um, but I think there's there's something that can be said about sharing our stories and mm -hmm. sharing our faith with, with other people and, and challenging and encouraging one another along the ways. Would you tell us just a little bit about your journey of faith? Yeah. You know, whatever you see fit, abbreviated version, the three yeah. hour version, whatever you think. I'll give you a... Uh... Uh, my my wife Veronica says I can't give an abbreviated version, yeah, but, but 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 I think I've gotten a little <laughs> briefer over the years, hopefully. But yeah, I I started out uh, really uh, as as a non-believer, came from a non-believing family. Uh, my had very limited exposure to church as a as a youngster, mainly around Easter when we'd visit my. Um, father's uncle in Bakersfield and we'd go out to the Catholic church and there was a lot of up and down and a lot of refraining and I was like a fish out of water. I didn't know what was going on, but um, I was just trying to, to, to be a really uh, a good, a good son and uh, enjoyed, uh, you know, the ambiance of being in church, but mm. really didn't understand uh, what it was all about. Um, and Christmas was kind of the same way. It was more about Santa Claus than, right. than, than Christ. So fast forward, um, I met my wife, Veronica, 35 years ago, and she was a very strong believer. And mm. I had been witness to many times in my life, none of which were very um, compelling to right. me. And uh, but we uh, we started to attend a church because I was open and that was in Carmel Valley um, and it was uh, Carmel Valley Baptist Church and they had a really uh, wonderful pastor, Andy Strong, and uh, had time to spend with him. And um, basically there was an altar call and I kind of did the uh, intellectual uh, exercise Pascal's wager. You can look that mm -hmm. up. And but in brief, it's like, hey, if Christ is real, and I can have everlasting life and forgiveness of my sins, uh, which were many, um, why wouldn't I want to have forgiveness and the love of God? Uh, and if that wasn't true, I really don't lose anything. Mm -hmm. So I really made an intellectual decision at the time hmm. uh, and responded to an altar call. And I have to say, as a basically after many, many years in science and medicine, you know, that's kind of like how my mind worked, right? right. So, and uh, it's kind of, uh, that's the way it could make sense to me. Right. So anyway, I accepted Christ and I, uh, said the sinner's prayer, and I, I believed it with all my heart. And the thing that I really wanted to have was I wanted to have a transformed life, and I wanted to have an authentic faith. So I was waiting for my mind and my body to be changed mm -hmm. by allowing the Holy Spirit in. Mm -hmm. But nothing happened. Mm -hmm. And so I said, wow, you know, so I've accepted Christ, but my life isn't any different. 
not only with actions, but also with thought. Mm. So I started to explore that again intellectually, because that's what I do. And I said, okay, well, I need to really get in and dig into the Bible and read the Bible, which I did. Particularly focused on the New Testament, which I did. Particularly focused on the four Gospels, mm -hmm. which I did. And nothing changed. Mm -hmm. So then I said, okay, I need to really get down and really get into prayer deeply, and I did. And <laughs> nothing changed. And so the next step was getting in a Bible study with my pastor, Andy men's group and nothing changed and then I figured out what the problem was because we were talking about a personal relationship with the God of the universe and as a physician as a doctor I knew that if I had a personal relationship with anyone I had to either I had to sense them so I had to feel them I had to see them, right. I had to hear them, I had to touch them, and that wasn't happening with God. So how mm. could I possibly have a personal relationship with anyone, let alone God of the universe, when I couldn't see, feel, hear, touch them, mm. right? Yeah. Didn't make sense. No, right. So I said, mm. okay, well, that's just kind of crazy, right? I mean, a personal relationship but I figured that's what everybody was telling me. That's what, that was the, as how I used to say, that was the heart of the artichoke. So if that was the goal and that would lead to my transformed life, how did I get there? How, how was I going to get there? And that was really frustrating. So I started to ask my friends, like I'd, I'd, I'd ask somebody like you, tell me how you came to faith. Mm -hmm. And here's what I got every single time these amazing testimonies. You know, I was hooked on drugs. My life was a mess. I was homeless. I had gambling addiction. Uh, I was cheating on my wife. Uh, you know, I was from an abusive childhood. Yeah. And these stories were so impactful. And I started thinking about it. And I said, you know what? That's the problem. I don't have a testimony, kind of don't have anything really mm -hmm. compelling. So I started to pray and I prayed for, because I'm very organized, I had, I had my <laughs> list of, of, of requests. I said, Lord, I, 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 think, I think I figured it out. I, I really want to have an authentic faith and I, I want to have a faith of action. You know, faith without deeds is dead, right? Mm -hmm. So I didn't just want to believe, but I actually wanted to do for God. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I started praying for a testimony. And I also said, hey, and while you're at it, if I could have some sort of physical touch or hear you or see you, that would really be, that, that, that'd be the icing on the cake. So I would say that prayer every day, every night, and then about three months later, God showed up. And it was in the form of something that I'd had my whole life I was born with, and that's something called an, an AVM, arterial venous malformation, for you know, simplifying a bit for people that aren't familiar with medical jargon, it's a kind of aneurysm. And mine was as big as a baseball, and it was deep embedded in the base of my brain uh, and, um, so God got my attention by, and it was really a gift. He, he caused that aneurysm to blow and bleed. And we call that a stroke. And it happened when I was doing something passionate that I was passionate about. And that was on the tennis court playing yeah. in a tennis tournament. And that led a few days later to, uh, looking at um, uh, an MRI scan. And, you know, I w had lost some vision uh, and um, severe headaches and um, nausea. And so I looked at that and I said, well, my life is over. Physical life is over because I had taken care of patients right, with these types it, of right. aneurysms. And as far as I knew, they were inoperable.
And this was really a bad one. So, but God saw fit to direct me up to UC San Francisco, where I had a very innovative surgery and a couple of extra things that they do to prepare uh, before the surgery. It's mm -hmm. called interventional radiology. I won't get into all the details. But um, my surgery was miraculously successful. And a little bit more of the story was I woke up from the surgery and uh, I was alive, but I didn't have any short-term memory. And that's really a bummer because if you don't have a short-term memory, all you have is the past. Right. So my future, not only was it in doubt, but it was impossible. Mm -hmm. And I remember, because my wife has told me, uh, day three in the neurosurgical unit at UCSF, I said, why haven't anybody come to see me? And she looked at me, she says, sweetheart, your parents just left mm. and you've had lots of people come and see you. Mm. You just don't remember them. And in fact, I couldn't wow. remember anything. So God had taken away, essentially, although the surgery was successful, he had taken away my life because I certainly wasn't gonna practice medicine anymore. I wouldn't remember anything. I was functionally not a vegetable, but not far from it. And I remember having this whole plan laid out in my head about my recovery. You know, I was gonna read the Bible. I was gonna pray every day. I was just gonna be in the word, mm -hmm. except I couldn't read at all. And the prayer to God was reduced to Jesus help. Yeah. And it was pretty grim. Mm -hmm. And then on the seventh day, I always had the television on for noise. It helped for some reason relieve the anxiety of my mental state. And on the seventh day, and I, I'm sorry, I can't remember if it was a Friday or a Saturday, but I was watching the 11 o'clock news, and this I remember, because this is where God showed up the second time. Um, a guy named Dave Dravecki <laughs> had just pitched and won his first game, at Candle, which was in Candlestick, after having a career-ending cancer yeah. in his pitching arm, in his shoulder and it had been rebuilt, it was successful. They said he'd never pitch again. They thought they'd have to even amputate his arm at the time. And he came back and he, that was his first night on the mound and he pitched and he won the game. And he was being interviewed on the news, local news, and they said, well, Dave, how do you explain this? And he said, I've been healed, but my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him I give all the glory. Mm -hmm. And you can look it out on YouTube. And I, right. I paraphrase it maybe a little bit. Right. But when I heard that, the closest thing I can say is it was like I stuck my finger in an electric socket. My kids at the time said, oh, Dad, it's easy. You know, Jesus just rebooted your computer. That's yeah, all. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and uh, I, I was able to appreciate hmm. a physical touch that I attribute to God. Wow. And... Literally, I went to bed that night. I woke up the next morning, and the first thing, these, this is how long ago it was, 33 years ago, I asked for the newspaper because I wanted to see if I had really experienced something or if I just dreamed it. For, for those who are a little mm -hmm. bit younger, what's a newspaper? Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's got all this printing on it. And, and remember, I couldn't read it all before right. because I couldn't, the words would just get all mixed up, right. kind of like dyslexia, right? Mm -hmm. You can't. And I grabbed the newspaper and I was reading it and I just started weeping and thanking God uh, because um, that, was, that was the beginning of having an authentic faith. Mm. And uh, my prayer at that time was, you know, I told God and I meant it. I said, 
I've lived the first 32 years of my life for one person, myself, mm -hmm. only child, myself. But I, I promised that I would live the rest of my life for Jesus. Mm. That's great. So be careful what you pay, <laughs> pray for. Well, that's uh, wow. Um, that's a. We should just end right now. Yeah, that's a, that's a great oh, yeah. story. Uh, I was going to ask you, you know, what are some obstacles or hurdles that get in the way? But I think you hit on one that's pretty big. That sometimes I think that our inability to see or touch God or to to right. feel a physical presence for right. for a lot of people is is an obstacle that is is hard for us to overcome. And I also think that you touched on the, the lack of a, a testimony or a story being a thing that we we do hear of other people who have, as you said, these compelling stories. Mm -hmm. like, wow, like they, they were delivered from that. Um, I don't have that. And right. So I think sometimes not only I think sometimes that prevents people from even pursuing God. My life's pretty good. Things are pretty decent. Yeah. I'm doing all right. Why would I need a savior or a deliverer or somebody to come in and fix things because things are pretty good. But then once, and really what we're talking about today is once you've come to faith, now what, you know, um, that can continue on even after making that decision. And I think I've seen that in your, in your life as being an obstacle. You know? Yeah, I think. And then, you know, once, once I developed my authentic faith mm -hmm. and really dove in and started to serve and, and and help um, work is the is is the biggest obstacle mm -hmm. for a lot of people. Right. For me, it's an opportunity because I get to share Jesus every day. I tell mm -hmm. people sometimes I think God decided I was pretty lazy right. when it comes to uh, to uh, you know sharing my face. So mm -hmm. he just he set me up in a job where I I, I really can't not. No, it's, it's part of built in built in so but really uh, that that can be i think for a lot of us as as americans mm -hmm. you know we just fill our fill our day up with with busyness and for for those of us that have demanding occupations sometimes that that can get in the way yeah yeah it was an interesting and a transparent moment uh, as a pastor i can say that there are times when my job gets in the way yeah. of my faith even though, of course, part of my job is helping people grow in their faith. It's about getting in the Bible. It's it's around the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. um, so often, I can get so wrapped up in the tasks of my job that they get in the that those tasks get in the way of my personal relationship with Jesus. And and it's a it's a weird place to be. I, I think over the years, I've I've had ebbs and flows and highs and lows and of is this God or is this my job? You know, is this yeah. my faith or, you know, I, I have had times in the past where I would always say, you know, the, the rank order in my life is God's number one. Mm -hmm. My wife is number two, you know, my mm -hmm. kids beyond that. And then everything else flows from there. And so I'd have times where something about work would get in the way of me and God or something about work would get in the way of me and my wife. And if it was that one, I'd always say, well, no, it's God. Right. Right. You were at the you were at the office ten hours when you said you'd be there for eight. Well, yeah, but that's God and God's my top priority. Mm -hmm. But I was doing a spreadsheet or I was writing a it wasn't God. It wasn't my relationship with him. You know, it was the job duties. All important and good stuff, but it definitely can get in the way. Yeah. Do you see any other obstacles that are kind of ongoing or hurdles that can get in the way of of that authentic faith or even just spiritual growth in general? Yeah, a big one for me has always been selecting time to Sabbath. And I've spent a lot of time uh, talking to Kevin about that, mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, originally, you know, I would say, well, gee, I'm a solo OBGYN. I'm doing God's work every day, kind of like a pastor, right? right? right. And, and so, so I kind of, uh, I kind of get an exemption, mm -hmm. but, but. You know, I've found out the hard way, you know, mm -hmm. through some health challenges that, uh, that that's not really the case and mm -hmm. that we're, we're, we're not God, uh, we're not superheroes, and uh, we, we really need to have time away and rest. And, mm -hmm. and uh, we've been uh, directed uh, that uh, that should be a, a full day mm -hmm. um, once a week. And... Uh, 
to uh, to try and um, talk my way out of that or manipulate and say, well, I had an hour here and an mm-hmm. hour here and an hour. No, that's right. that's not what we're talking about. So, in the past, that has been a been a pretty big obstacle. Now, uh, I've transitioned to to part time work, so I can really take a full day, mm-hmm. and and you know be at the at the feet of the Lord and. Uh, I get refreshed being outdoors. Mm-hmm. So that's where I find that time and it's it's really rich and really good. Yeah, there's a lot of pieces to the Christian faith um and growing in that faith and 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 we can talk we'll probably talk through a few of those, you know, mm-hmm. during our time uh, what Shoreline Church calls their spiritual markers. Right. Um, but Sabbath I think is is a big one and I think is worth uh, especially when we talk about Again, getting real about faith, you know, like, like we say, Hey, that's my business. Like you don't understand how busy I am or what responsibilities Mm -hmm. I have. Like, like you want me to ignore my family. You want me to Mm -hmm. not provide for them. Do you want me to, you know, let these babies go undelivered or whatever it is. Um, but I think it's an important thing as we pursue the Christian faith that, that we are honest, Mm -hmm. like we really do look at ourselves and be introspective and seek out God, seek out other people that can speak into our lives. And, and for us to say, you know what, God, God set the example, you know, and on the seventh day resting Mm -hmm. it, Sabbath was built into, to our faith from the beginning, even before Jesus walked on this earth, you know, it was part Mm -hmm. of the, uh, the nation of Israel and what they did Mm -hmm. and the, the Hebrew people and, and, through Judaism. And I mean, like there's been lots of different renditions or versions of it along the way. Mm-hmm. Um, but that it's, it is built in and it's so easy for us to say, but I'm busy. And I think actually, I can't speak worldwide, but I can say in, in the circles that I travel in and what I can see, it's actually looked upon as like something you should wear as like a badge of honor. If someone comes to me and says, you know, I haven't had a day off in a month, right? They're actually bragging about it Mm -hmm. that would be like in some things you know what i've lied every day for the last month like would Mm -hmm. you actually brag about that i've stolen something every day for the last month you wouldn't do that you know but when we talk about not taking a break not taking time and setting it aside uh, to both rest and spend time with god we again i think we we kind of wear that as a badge of honor you know and uh, have you seen that in the medical world that that's a, a big thing all the time yeah. yeah yeah i mean you know uh you see that people say uh particularly in training you know mm-hmm. the, you know at one point i was up for almost 72 hours and i was sort of carted <laughs> off the ward and put to bed by by one of the senior faculty because i was kind of hallucinating and basically falling asleep standing right. up and that got me quite the reputation mm-hmm. of being the the Iron Man. You know, I was an intern, and that's the guy right, right. there. But uh, fairly unhealthy, right? Mm-hmm. A- at any point in your life, I thought of something as you were talking about the importance of uh, Sabbath and a and uh, sort of in an analogous fashion. I remember when my wife had our first daughter, Tess, and she was you know twenty four seven mom. I'd be off working, and I would come home, and my wife would be pretty rattled and very early in um, raising our daughter Tess, I told my wife, I said, hey, I think you need a, at least one day off a week. And it turned out she took two half days. But I was fortunate and I was in a position where I could support that. Mm-hmm. But I, I I realized that it, it, it was just too tough, that 24-7, seven, seven days mm-hmm. a week, I mean, there was no Sabbath, right, with a Right. With a a newborn uh, and and a, and a toddler even, but right. I was able to recognize that hey, this isn't going to work long term right. if we don't get some relief, and I was able to 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 arrange that actually mm-hmm. through family and um, but yeah, I think we all need that and we fight it mm-hmm. because somehow we think that if we're resting, we're 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 uh, we're weak as you said, or, right. or it's a failure when it's really a strength. And I'm also reminded that, you know, on the seventh day, God rested and we forget that. Right. But, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a hard one. It's a hard one, particularly for someone I believe who's a pastor and, uh, and also physicians, we kind of share that in right. common. 
Yeah, yeah and, I, and I think we can, as we look at how you live out the Christian faith, I think when we talk about um, getting into the nitty gritty of it or getting real, it can feel like uh, we're talking about being legalistic. Yeah. Um, and the reality is that we're not. You know, mm-hmm. as you said, God set the example in resting on the seventh day. And I don't, and I'm not trying to belabor this. I think it really mm-hmm. matters for us to say, this is a big, a big obstacle in our, in our faith. I mm-hmm. believe that, um, uh, just a couple weeks ago, we did a, a podcast and we were talking about health mm-hmm. uh, and we had, uh, Dr. Lori Mazza here, uh, mm-hmm. who's a sleep expert. And we got to talk about sleep and the importance of that. You know, and if you don't sleep, like just sleep, not the not the rest of it, but if you don't mm-hmm. sleep, your body is going to just shut down. Right. right. And she shared some statistics about, you know, if you go, you know, 24 hours without sleep, it's like you have a blood alcohol content of like 0.08, you know, mm-hmm. like that really makes a difference to you. And you did 72 hours. Of mm-hmm. course you were delirious. I mean, you, it was though you were intoxicated, you know, mm-hmm. your mind was not working the way you need to. Now that's our daily rhythm of physically sleeping, but really the same kind of thing applies to us spiritually and emotionally. And if we're not mm-hmm. taking time away, you know, and I think we also think sometimes that maybe it's not going to, we won't, everything won't get done if we're not doing it. Like right? mm-hmm. the world, you know, I, I have that problem, right? Like I can't shut my phone off. You know, like mm-hmm. the world will shut down if I don't, you know, but the reality is I've had my battery die or I've left my phone somewhere where I didn't have it and nothing really major did happen. You know, I was forced into that situation, but, Mm -hmm. but, you know, taking Sabbath, you know, setting that time aside is good for us personally. And we're not going to go through and then do this and do this and do this and do this. Um, But I think that is one that was, I'm glad that led into that because it's really worth us uh, spending some time. Yeah. And really taking a Sabbath is not doing, right? you know, (laughs) right. Right. It's, it's, it's time to reflect, refresh Mm -hmm. and reflect in the presence of right. the Lord. Mm. So rather than it being a to-do list, right. it's a not do. Right. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, I was reading about um, Sabbath uh, a couple of years ago, Pastor Kevin um, uh, had me talk about it a little bit uh, in one of his messages. And I was rereading the Ten Commandments and I was struck by the fact that more is written in terms of words uh, about the importance of taking a Sabbath than any other commandment. Hmm. And I'm like, more than coveting, more than murder. I mean, I'm like, that's wild. Uh And I think that might, to me anyway, uh, it spoke to the importance of that Mm -hmm. commandment and maybe the difficulty that people have. Right. So... Well, back on the, the, the tangent we were on. Sure. Um, you talk about the hardship that you encountered early on in your faith. Um, so then from there on, has it just been pretty simple and straightforward and no no ups and downs? Oh, yeah. I just, uh, just like a rocket ship straight up. Yeah, that's a pretty cool thing, right? <laughs> that Jesus says, you know, come follow me and all will be easy. Yeah, right? it's just, no, 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 it hasn't. And there's been lots and lots of challenges. And... Uh, putting it, you know, challenges across the board, challenges with uh, my uh, personal life, with Mm -hmm. uh, with family, um, with my work, um, with friends, uh, with church. I mean, it's a messy world. And uh, what I what I think I put it in this perspective that every time I'm doing something significant for the kingdom i'm becoming a bigger target for the enemy and my family becomes a target and my personal life becomes a target and my wife and i recognize that and Mm -hmm. together as a team it's really helpful because sometimes we'll experience a real tragedy or hardship and usually we'll look at that and say you know that isn't from God. Mm -hmm. That's from the other guy. That's from the evil one, the liar, the deceiver. And that's pretty true across the board. Um, So a little example is, uh, and forgive me, Tess, but um, she, my (laughs) oldest daughter got married this, this uh, last, last weekend on Friday. And uh, so 
beautiful wedding. She was uh, married by a friend of the groom's who is a, a worship leader and an ordained pastor, and it was absolutely beautiful. But was it a perfect wedding? No, far from it. I mean, there were a few little hitches, mm -hmm. and it had to do with people. Right. And there were a couple of people that were just not not so great. Mm -hmm. And what we did is, you know, after this beautiful wedding where nobody really would have noticed, but, you know, the few of us, we started to pick it apart. We're like, ah, this and you're grumbling. And, and we're like, but I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Mm -hmm. We need to keep it in perspective right. because wouldn't it just be like Satan to try and ruin a beautiful, wonderful right. experience. So we flipped it around. We said, we're not going there. We're not mm -hmm. going to be grumbling. We're not going to be complaining about some silly little trivial stuff that happened between right. two or three people during this wonderful day. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of an analogy for what really my life is like, right. that every day the glory of God and the experiences that, that I've had generally far outshine any any difficulties and yes there are there have been dark days and there have been dark moments and there have been occasionally dark weeks but those are tests those are trials and uh i mean that's when my faith has grown the most mm -hmm. and uh and keeping it in perspective sometimes is a challenge but um it's yeah you're you you enter you enter into a personal relationship with with Jesus and uh you know you don't have to walk very far to know that it's going to be a challenge. Right. And I think that's actually one of the things that kind of gets in the way if you have one of these amazing testimonies or these complete life transformations yeah. that you expect. Well, I was miserable and now that I have this it should just be yeah. smooth sailing or or you'll have people I think within the faith that will you know like quote like Romans 8:28 and God works all things for good and they're yeah. just like hey you're going to have a good life it's all yeah. going to be wonderful and I think that's often what can happen when we try to pluck mm -hmm. a single verse or idea out of the Bible is that we we kind of miss the whole context right. right God can use these negative things these mm -hmm. bad things these these obstacles, these uh, rough patches in our life for good, and he can make something mm -hmm. wonderful out of them. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's only always going to be wonderful. In fact, I think he said something like, if anyone would be my disciple, he must pick up his cross daily mm -hmm. and follow me. What does that mean to you to, to pick up your cross daily? Yeah, basically that means that I have to do the work of the kingdom and sometimes that work is going to be difficult. Sometimes that's going to be burdensome. It's going to take me places where I may not want to go. Mm -hmm. God may be sending me somewhere, either physically or, or mentally or uh, emotionally, into areas where you know I don't want. I don't want to be carrying a cross. That yeah. it's heavy and it's 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 a lot. But the the work of God is tantamount. And, um, you know, there's going to be easy days and hard days. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that cross is pretty light, you know. It's like Jesus is making my burden light. But sometimes that cross is pretty, pretty hard to carry. And mm -hmm. even I sometimes stop and have to rest. All right. So, You know, you mentioned Satan, and I think that's an important uh, thing for us to talk about because I think we also kind of try to gloss it, over yeah it. and we don't want to talk about an enemy yeah. or the devil or Satan yeah. or, or that um, and yeah there's some things that are here that maybe get in the way or obstacles but I think it is important for us to address that we do have an enemy that you know I think often we give credit to a situation mm -hmm. when we should actually give blame you know to right. to Satan Um what do you think are some of the tactics or even temptations or stumbling blocks that, that Satan can put out there that can get in the way or prevent us from truly pursuing our faith with passion? Well, you know, we live in a, in a, in a world where there's a lot of temptation. And I think, 
Uh, I can think of the biggest tool right now that everybody is, well, not everyone, but but sort of the world at large is fascinated with and falling in love with, and that's uh, that's uh, social media and technology, right? Mm -hmm. And it just continues to evolve, you know, into different forms. But the reason I think that that is uh, uh, the biggest uh, sort of impediment and, and risk to living out God's will for our life is because it can absorb so much of our time, our energy, our passions. And I was struck, uh, I do work in Guatemala, mm -hmm. um, people may know about. And so here I'm, you know, in Central America, one of the poorest countries uh, in the world, and certainly one of the poorest, the poor, one of the poorest in, 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 in Latin America. Everyone has a cell phone. Mm -hmm. Everyone. I mean, it's unbelievable. Right. And they are they are in an intimate relationship <laughs> with it. And so I think that that uh, is probably the biggest distraction. And I'm not anti-technology, right. please. I mean, you know, I'm a physician. Right. I, 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 uh, I require technology and I need technology, but I think uh, we have to be careful with mm -hmm. it. So I think that's, I think that's the number one impediment right well i'm kind of that's an interesting thing uh my my high school students have the opportunity today to have their phones in a locker for 24 hours um, i'm curious to hear how that went and how many of them actually did it mm -hmm. um and so i don't know that either of my kids were interested in doing that at all and we did leave that up to them so mm -hmm. i'm curious to see this evening whether they come home with cell phones or not but uh it is a it's a hard thing you know yeah and, and i do think that um and it's not even yeah you talked about social media because what it's not necessarily even the fascination with the social media, which is a big thing and it takes time away from us. But, mm -hmm. but also what we see there, I think is this false picture, this oh, false narrative of what's yeah. going on around us. And we're thinking, well, these other people who mm -hmm. aren't pursuing their faith, who don't mm -hmm. aren't denying themselves daily, look at what they have and their life is so amazing and so wonderful. That's what I want to have. You know, I don't right. want to, give up and deny myself and go without. And, uh, and I think that that's, that, that definitely is a hard one that, mm -hmm. that's to be there. And I also think that maybe a lot of it has to do with us having maybe like a short term view. Like we're, mm -hmm. we're looking at this immediate and that's, that's right. That's our, um, the way our society is, you know, we can be mm -hmm. in a fast food line, you know, at the drive through and we get impatient because we have to wait in this line. We're impatient about being in a line where all we have to do is tell somebody what we want. And in a few minutes, they're going to hand us a bag, you know, yeah. uh, we've just, we've just gotten, I need it now immediately. Right. You know, I can remember early on in, in the internet world where we had dial up connection, you know, and our, our phone would make this weird noise that I can't mm. replicate right now, or I would try to do so. Uh, and it would take minutes, you know, for us to connect to the internet. Mm. And today I'm like, oh, this is so slow. It took me like three minutes to download a, a full length movie. You know, mm -hmm. that should just be here right now. We just we just get in that way. It should it should just be easy. And I think mm -hmm. that that's a, a big obstacle uh, in, in Hebrews uh, 10. It says, uh, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run with perseverance the race marked mm -hmm. out before us um, and throw off any Thing that hinders or, or entangles us. Um, why do you think it's good to to look at those who have run the race well, who have finished mm -hmm. well, whether it be those in the Bible or maybe those in in our life that we've mm -hmm. seen? What do you think it? Why do you think it's important to look at their lives and and see how maybe we could emulate them or fall in their footsteps? Yeah, I think that uh, you know we 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 all need people as you said to to emulate we need examples you know you you know i'm not a big sports person but you know you look at how we worship sports heroes right mm -hmm. and and what we're really what people really are enjoying is their athletic prowess mm -hmm. right they're doing things that very few people can do because mm -hmm. they don't have those physical attributes and that's inspiring. And I think in a similar way, 
people that live very altruistic lives who, um, you know, supersede and exceed what anyone expects, society expects, or their, mm. you know, their family expects. It's it it is inspiring, you know, and and we need role models, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it, it, that role model can be personal. It can be right. our fathers, or it could be uh, Mother Teresa, or uh, you know, I'm always talking to people on a very basic level when they get complaining about, oh, there's no more good people, you know, there are no good, you know, pick your favorite, you know, there right. there are no good Republicans, there are no good Democrats, there, you know, there are no good Christians, there are no good Jewish people. And I'm like, no, there was this guy named Jesus, mm -hmm. and he was without sin, and I, I really do. I talk to people. I say, well, I disagree. I mean, hey, listen, people, you know, People people generally are bad. Right. You know, I'm sorry. I, I have arguments sometimes <laughs> with, with one of my good friends, Bruce, who uh -huh. believes that people are generally good. They're generally altruistic. It's right. the world that really messes you up. Mm -hmm. No, we don't have, as we know, we don't have to right. to, to instruct um, children to right. be selfish and, and uh, you know, we have to instruct them to get along and share. Right. But, I often, I often yeah. share that, like... Uh, a uh, baby's like first words usually like mommy and the second one's daddy and the third is mine you know and uh we are selfish you know yeah. we uh we don't have to teach kids to do that but i'm sorry go ahead yeah. yeah so um no so i think that uh i mean you know that always leads into a discussion gingerly with some people more than mm -hmm. others of uh there was there was a a, a perfect example of somebody that uh, can be a hero to everybody right. that we all can emulate that is a model and uh, it's uh, you know I remember I'm old enough that you know I was a Bob Dylan fan and he's had a storied career but there was a point at which he he's Jewish but he became a believer and he was a Christian and he wrote Christian songs uh, and um, one of the things that he said very simply is we all have to serve somebody hmm. That's in his lyrics, and it's it's so simple, but it's true. Right. We all have to serve somebody, and it's up to us. Who are we going to serve? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think to your point, circling back around, uh, we're made with, the, it's in our DNA to emulate somebody, mm -hmm. to have a hero figure, to have somebody that that is uh, a mountaintop person that we can strive to be like. Right. And I think we have to be careful because if we choose people in popular culture, uh, well, generally there's a backstory that's not going to be so yeah. swell. Yeah. So, so in, in the Christian faith, one of our our main things is that in our faith, there's nothing that you need to do, and people mm -hmm. say a different way, um, but but basically we say. All the other world religions, there's stuff you have to do. Right. You got to prove yourself. You've got uh, deeds that have to be done. You got to earn things, and in our faith, you don't. And and I think that often because of that, once someone comes from being an unbeliever to a believer, lost to saved, mm -hmm. without Jesus to a relationship with Him, they often just think that's it. Like that, I'm done. Like this mm -hmm. is it. I now have heaven awaiting me. Yeah. And they don't do anything along the way. Well, here at Shoreline, we think that we're missing out. Like, right. And really, that's it. So it's not about legalism. Right. It's about you're going to miss out on all that God has for you. And we've, you know, we've created these seven spiritual markers mm -hmm. that Kevin mm -hmm. and Sherry wrote about in their mm -hmm. um, Organic Disciples book. Um, so I thought we'd spend a few minutes just talking through those and, uh, and get your thoughts on on yeah. what that can look like as we as we dive into our faith a little bit deeper. And then let's start with Bible engagement. So yeah. to you, how does Bible engagement feed into us growing in our faith? And, and how have you seen that work in your life? Yeah, so I've, I now read the Bible every morning when I wake up. And I think, you know, it's important to pick your time, you know, right. and I'm, I'm, more clear-headed and sort of after a now after a good night's sleep <laughs> um 
I'm I'm fresh and alert, and there's not a lot of uh, trash. Mm-hmm. You know, and when I say trash, I mean things like, okay, I got to do this, I got to do that. There's going to be this patient I've got to see today, and then I got to get home for dinner, and you know, all that is gone. Mm-hmm. And I, I clean slate, and I can sit down with with a journal, and read scripture, mm-hmm. uh, pray about it, and think about what God wants for me that day. And starting out with an inspiration like that has been life changing. Mm-hmm. And that's been a transition because, again, I have to say, before I was part-time, I would get up at 5.30 in the morning and I'd be at the hospital. Wow. And then I'd say, okay, well, tonight I'm going to go home and I'm going to do my Bible reading. Sure. (laughs) Not happening. Pass out, right. Yeah, so um, that's been a real transformation for me. And I went from not really focusing on daily Bible reading as a discipline, and it is. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, and I'm in no disrespect, it's like, look at all the other things I have to do when I get up in the morning, you know, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, That's lots. Lots to do, and I built that in, and it's been transformative. And as somebody that's read the Bible many times, here's the other big aha moment for me, because I've heard it a lot, but somebody will say, no matter how well you know, a book, a verse, a scripture, rereading it in a new light can give you new insight. I'm like, oh, you know, yeah, right. No, it's absolutely true. And I'll sit down and I'll read uh, a passage and I'll go, huh, wow, I never really noticed that before, but it's saying something different than it has the other 20 times that Mm -hmm. I've read it. So that's been very exciting. But I think it, it's a discipline and you got right. you just gotta make time. And mm-hmm. you know what? We waste so much time. And I'm I'm the biggest right. uh you know uh gu- I'm I'm guilty of that, right. you know. And I think as we, you know, and we're we're not gonna spend a lot of time mm-hmm. on each of these, but as we go through yeah. them, time can be a recurring theme in there, so we can get that out of the way right now. If you really yeah. audit your time and you take a look at it, you got lots. You got a lot more than you think you yeah. do. And uh, and I know for me, I'll often say, "Oh, I don't have time for yeah. whatever the thing is." But if I look at where I'm spending my time and how I'm doing it, and even things that aren't necessarily bad, maybe I'm just not planning it out the right way. You know, yeah. I I leave my house and I drive into town and go to a store and then I drive back home and then I'm like, oh, and I gotta go get gas and then I drive yeah. out again. Wait, I just spent another. 30 minutes just getting gas like nothing wrong with getting gas yeah. but i could have done that on my trip to the store there's ways that we can work mm-hmm. through our time a little bit more and and better. disclaimer big big disclaimer when we did the spiritual growth gross growth gross growth <laughs> assess see i am a dr gross <laughs> growth assessment that that was one of my my lowest mm. uh, scores and it really again was get back to you know, work and busyness. Yeah. And, you know, I, you can make all kinds of uh, excuses, but here's the thing. This is really important. Before mm-hmm. I did it, I, I mean, on a regular daily basis, I didn't know what I was missing. Uh, that's a great point, uh-huh. you know. So we're going it, to... It's not you read the Bible because you have to read the Bible. You read the Bible because... God's going to mold you and shape mm-hmm. you. He's going to speak to you. You're going to hear from him. And and that's really a big part. I mean, that's that's what the relationship with mm-hmm. Jesus is about, is that we're going to connect with our God. Another way we can connect with him is through passionate prayer. Yeah. What does your prayer life look like? Oh, man. Score very high on that. <laughs> because um, I, you know, in the morning, at bedtime, I'll, and then really, here's here's the thing. I pray throughout the day mm-hmm. constantly um, because I have situations throughout the day mm-hmm. where I need to have God with me, right. you know, because I'm either there's a medical challenge, a uh, uh, challenge with family, right. friends, you name it, schedule. I mean, again, I really look at the work that I do where, I mean, it's very easy for me to find something to pray about right. all throughout my day. Mm-hmm. And it's not hard for me to to say, 
you know, Lord, uh, you know, this is this this could be really difficult. Mm-hmm. This pregnancy, you know, the details, Lord. I'm taking this woman in to to have a child to bring life into the world. I need you with me because mm-hmm. I I can't can't do this by myself. Right. And yeah. I'm thinking that most of us can do that, whatever we're going through, right. whether we're right. putting together a sermon, bringing a child in this world, or yeah. serving a customer at our restaurant. Yeah, you know, we we can be uh, we can have God come alongside us and help guide us and direct us and move through us. Uh, well, I have this picture of you know you said throughout the day there will be periodic times throughout the day. Sometimes it's taking care of business. Sometimes it's just hey, I was thinking of you. Uh, my wife and I will text each mm-hmm. other just in the middle of the day, and I see that you know if if you know I left in the morning and didn't talk to her because mm-hmm. maybe she was still in bed because I got up early, and then mm-hmm. I get home late, um, or she gets home late and I'm already in bed and we mm-hmm. don't talk. Like if we kept doing that, like we would not have a great relationship. We wouldn't mm-hmm. know each other. Mm-hmm. But but even those those quick little check ins. Again, sometimes it's logistics. Hey, who's going to pick up the 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 boy after soccer? Who's mm-hmm. going to get the girl to the the birthday party? Um, or sometimes it's just I was thinking of you. I want you to know I love you. Uh, we can do that same kind of thing with God, you know. Yeah. And I think that keeps that conversation going with him yeah wholehearted worship is another one yeah um, can i circle back yeah, please, real quick absolutely because i thought of i thought of something that i thought was kind of uh worth sharing on, mm-hmm. a, on a personal note i'm really thankful that uh sherry wrote the book uh, praying with eyes wide open mm-hmm. um prior to reading that book i would always pray with my eyes closed try and focus have a in a, in a quiet place and mm-hmm. um and i loved i love uh um when the spirit leads, uh, praying with my patients. And so there was one time, um, however, prior to praying with eyes wide open, where um, I had a patient who was really, really nervous. Mm-hmm. She was going to have a C-section. And I'm like, you know, I've done uh, over a thousand C-sections. I mean, wow. like, <laughs> and so it's just another day at the office for me. But but so I prayed with her beforehand in the, in the operating room and I prayed with her and I asked for, you know, comfort and safety and that everybody would be, you know, at their best and, and the Lord would be present. And um, so then I start um, doing the C-section and, and we're well, we're, we're well into it here. Mm-hmm. And, um, and she's, it's not the easiest C-section. She's kind of bleeding and she goes, I'm so nervous. I'm so nervous. Dr. Alexander, would you mind praying with me again? <laughs> and and I was thinking, I'm going to shut my eyes yeah. right now. And, <laughs> and I just said, uh, well, you know, I will, but not right now. I've got to finish up and deliver your baby. And now it's great because mm-hmm. if I'm faced with that again, which I haven't been yet, but I probably will be, I'll be glad to pray. But at the time, oh, I'm wow. like, oh, my gosh, yeah. I cannot close my eyes. We got a little trouble going on in River City and we got to take care of this. So yeah. anyway, that's, that's a great kinda... story. Yeah, you can pray anytime. Yeah, in the, exactly. In the car, it doesn't matter wherever yeah. you are. You can do that. Well, wholehearted worship is is the next one on right. the list, and uh, I mean, for for a lot of people, that's about singing songs right. to God. Uh, do you see it as being anything different in your world than that? Oh yeah, I I I I, I certainly do, and I think that that is so incredibly important. Uh, we we worship with our whole being Mm. you know we worship i i mean i worship when i'm walking and giving god glory for the amazing world that he's created um i love to worship by singing uh i i worship by working um i worship when i'm out to a restaurant and i thank god i for for the beautiful meal i i i as i'm thanking and and asking uh the wait staff if they have something Mm -hmm. they want uh, me to pray about. I mean, and that I think is something that people, particularly people that are young in their faith, don't mm-hmm. understand that 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 worship is is truly the way I look at it. The word is it's a celebration, and That's you can great. you can celebrate very different ways at very different times, mm-hmm. but it's a celebration of God's goodness. That to me is worship. I love that. And when you talked about in, in in nature and his creation. I, I think for me, one of the uh, turning points in that has been shifting from, and I've 
heard other people say this before we should not worship the creation right that we should worship the creator right um and even just this morning as i was driving along the coast and there were some amazing waves out yeah. there and i was just in awe of those waves i yeah i had to go back to but god is the one who mm-hmm. has made these waves possible and that he's mm-hmm. the one who deserves that glory um that's cool mm-hmm. uh humble service what does service look like? I don't in, do in any the, of that. Yeah, no. What does that look like in the life of a Christian who's actually trying to live out their faith? Yeah, well, for me, that that's one of those areas that I think God designed me for service mm-hmm. um, from the very beginning. Uh, I mean, it's what I do um, as often as I can, as long as I can. I, I thank God for that. It's my occupation is service oriented. Obviously, I try and serve my family and serve my friends and serve my church and serve my hospital and mm-hmm. serve my community and serve Guatemala. Right. It it's like breathing for mm-hmm. me. Um, I and and literally, it's. I mean, it's effortless because it's just it's just in me, mm. um, and uh, it gives me. Great joy. Yeah. Well, and that's that's a good point where you say it's effortless for you. Yeah. You know, for some of these these pieces of the the they're co- we call them spiritual markers. Yeah. Um, for some of us, one of them is going to be easy, and one of them is going to take a little bit of work. And, yeah. And I think an important piece to remember is that, but they're all part of what it means to live out our our, our faith. It does say in Mark yeah. ten forty five, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve yeah. and to give his life as a ransom for many. And really, as we get real about our faith, we really need to understand that that the goal in this is to follow the example of Jesus, to yeah. try to I used the word emulate earlier, emulate him. We're, we're trying to be like him. Mm-hmm. Never going to be that way. He's right. he perfect example, but that's something that we should be striving for. Yeah. Um, uh, next one is joyful generosity. Yeah. And uh, we won't spend a lot of time on on this one. We talked about finance just a few mm-hmm. weeks ago, which is an important thing. But but how do you see generosity being part of of the life of a Christian who's growing in their faith? Yeah, well, you know, again, it's 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 my contribution to my local church, but it's also my contribution to uh, other ministries that that I believe in because in the world we live in. Nothing gets done if the bills don't get paid. True, very true. And, you know, I've had the honor and the privilege of not only serving on the leadership team, but also our finance team. Mm. And um, it's it's very, very important that we literally, I'd like to just use the word, we, we need to invest in the work of the gospel. Amen. And whether it's, financial which i believe well i i give of my time fantastic mm-hmm. well i pray fantastic i'm i'm not saying all those things are not important i volunteer well right. that's great but at the end of the day we live in a capitalist world or society not every right. country is capitalist obviously <laughs> but but it we need to invest our our finances our gifts to the church Mm -hmm. and without it 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 wouldn't be here i remember when i first became a christian uh, at carmel valley baptist church they they did a a fundraiser because they were they were putting together a multi-purpose room for youth Mm -hmm. and i was really young in my faith and and i i didn't even think to contribute to that and I, i i remember uh, and hopefully I've made up for it <laughs> since then. But I just remember going, wow, they built that whole building. I wonder who gave all that money. <laughs> That's great. Uh, we got two more. Okay. Consistent community. What is community? Yeah. Why is that important in the life of, a, of yeah. someone who's looking to grow in their faith? Beautiful. So God did not design us to be alone. I think to be alone is is one of the most painful things that we can all experience when we think we when we lose a spouse when we lose a pet solitary confinement can it be any worse Mm -hmm. um and i think people 
expanding on that. So we're not meant to be alone, but but more than that, we're meant to 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 move outside our immediate family because we want to be participants in the family of God. And I, I mean, even for people that are real introverts and mm-hmm. kind of like like their quiet time, that's right. great. But but take a step out, and there are so many great communities. I'm gonna sound I'm I'm gonna sound like a advertisement <laughs> for small groups at Shoreline. Um, you know, just about anything that you're passionate about, we have a small group. I just I just found the running group. Yes, and I'm in. Sounds great. And uh, but you know it. You're just going to grow when you're surrounded mm-hmm. by like-minded people, like-minded people in terms of their faith, right. but very uh, different people in terms of their life experience, sure. coming together with one common uh, uh, passion mm-hmm. in addition to their faith, yeah. you know, something that they enjoy. I think, uh, I think consistent community is super important, and I think that's been one of the things that... Uh, we have lost in our culture because we can all sit home with our iPads and we can go virtually anywhere we want and we can have virtual friends and we can have fun emojis to Mm -hmm. send back and forth. And no, that's not the way we're designed. Yeah, the last few years has thrown a little bit of a wrinkle in that. And I don't want to get too too physiologic and (laughs) and put on my doctor cap, but, but we know that one of the markers for longevity and health and mental health is being in consistent community. Yeah. Um, it, it, it physiologically, your blood pressure is better. You're, you're, you're healthier. Um, absolutely. It, it, there's no doubt. And you, when you look at cultures that live the longest, they have great communities. And usually they're faith communities too, I might add. And that's, I'm not making it up. Yeah, it's no, true. That's great stuff. You can research it. I yeah. think an important piece on that also is you talked about the introvert maybe feeling like they don't need it for mm-hmm. themselves. Um, but to flip that on the other side, but they might bring something to that community yes. that somebody else needs. And so, um, you know, Paul talks regularly about us being a body and that the, the, the church is a body in mm-hmm. each part belongs to all the others and the hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. Right. Um, and within the church body, the, the body of Christ, um, really each person is essential and is, is necessary. And back to that running group. And so even like a group like that, it's a running to walking or walking mm-hmm. to running group. Mm-hmm. Some people go short distance, some will go longer, some will go faster, yeah. some will go slower. There really is space, not only within that group, but within the mm-hmm. church and within our community to have people that are at different paces and you know, mm-hmm. how they're pursuing their faith, where they are in life and how long they've been a Christian and all of that. And the last one is organic outreach. Mm-hmm. And obviously that's a big thing to, to our church and mm-hmm. a big thing to, to Pastor Kevin and, and Sherry, who've written mm-hmm. multiple books on this. What does organic outreach look like to you in the life of a Christian who's trying to, to grow in their faith? Well, you know, it's it's the Great Commission, right? Mm-hmm. We are called by Jesus to, call, to go and make disciples of all nations. Absolutely. Right? And uh, that, what I love about Kevin and his embracing organic outreach, one of the fundamental callings on his life is that he's given us tools mm-hmm. by which we can do that. Absolutely. And again, it's it's very refreshing because... There isn't just one way to seek the lost, right. to share Jesus, right? Mm-hmm. There are m- a multitude of ways, and we all have different walks of life. We all have different occupations. We all have different interests. And um, so I, lo- I love the calling that Kevin has had, and I, I love being part of organic outreach. I mean, I've got lots and lots of stories, and I was on the influence team for many years. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that one of the things about organic outreach, and he, he, it's in his books, is it's not a program. Right. It it is a way of life, and that you know we are we are called to share Jesus with with mm-hmm. those that don't know Him. Absolutely. We're not to convert those people. That's up to God. But we're to always be prepared. 
to give a to give our story yeah. to give a what does it say a uh, 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 the Bible says an account right. we are always supposed to be ready to give an account mm -hmm. and that can be um, our testimony or what I've found recently is you know sharing today yesterday more um, uh, contemporarily right. What, what has God been doing in my life now? Mm -hmm. My testimony is powerful as it is. It's got lots of moving parts. It takes too long. I, I, I'll share what, what God's doing in my life today, what God did yesterday. I'll try and make it applicable to where somebody is. Mm -hmm. I have a friend that doesn't know, know Jesus, and uh, I've been working my, my whole adult life uh, sharing with him. And one of the things that, that I'll do is when he presents a, a, a challenge or an issue in his life, uh, I'll ask him, well, how are you handling that? Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'll try and tell him, well, you know, um, you know, there's somebody that can help you with that. And sometimes he laughs and he goes, sure. yeah, I yeah, know, you're going. going to tell me the <laughs> Jesus thing again. I'm like, but no, you know, seriously, let me tell you uh, what's happened to me right. lately. So you think yeah. if someone is looking to get real about their faith and take their 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 faith seriously and want to grow in it you think it's okay for them to, to maybe focus really on like one or two of these areas um or do you think that there should be maybe uh, uh like equal distribution or, or efforts put in this like is it okay to just say you know what i just read the bible every day and so i am a growing christian because i read for hours and yeah. hours and hours today. i don't do the other stuff but that one is good yeah that's i think then you're you're stuck mm-hmm and you're not you're not living the abundant life. Um, I had some friends. I have some friends that go to another church. Uh, they know the Lord. I love them to death, and and I've talked to them about organic outreach, and and they said that's great. But you know, um, I'm not an evangelist, right. and uh, and 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 we really, our church is a discipleship church, right. and I've I've heard that a lot you know, over the years, but it's not an either or. It should never be an either or. And the beauty of the seven markers of spiritual growth is it has within the fabric of those markers, it has all of those things. It has discipleship, it has outreach, it has giving, it has worship. It touches on the fundamental aspects of, of becoming uh, growing in your faith, okay. and and uh, you know, really, that's what you want. Mm -hmm. You, if you, if you love Jesus, um, you really want to have the abundant life, the mm -hmm. authentic life, right. um, and uh, it's a journey. And right. like you said, it's it's not a linear progression. Right. You know, there's peaks and valleys, there's ups and downs, there's challenges. Um, you know, do I do everything every day? I try, but. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I I do my best, right? And uh, I love I love pursuit of physical health and and fitness and nutrition and all those yeah. kinds of things. And there's so many analogies that I can you know find in there. Like if I go to the gym and I like to lift weights, and all I ever do ever is bicep curls, and I right. only do it with my right arm, I'm going to have a massive right bicep. Right. Everything else is going to be falling apart, but I'll have this huge arm. Like that wouldn't make sense right. if I say, you know what? What I really, really do is I spend all of my time sleeping, right? Because right. sleep is important and exercise is important and nutrition is important. But I really, I want to focus on the sleep. So all I do is sleep. So I just yeah. lay in bed all, you're not going to be a healthy person. Right. And if you picked any one of those pieces, you, you, you need to have them all. And now you might do some better than others. Some might be more natural, but but you really need to to focus on them all to get the most out of your, your physical health. And, and with the, your spiritual health, I think it's the same thing, that God has put these all in place as tools and as also markers or mm -hmm. measurables on how we're growing mm -hmm. in our faith because he knows what's best. And, and so if we follow along in those, uh, in those lines, I think that we will have, as you said, an abundant life. We'll have the most rich, full mm -hmm. spiritual life that we can have. So you know, as we wrap up, do you have any yeah. last thoughts or any first steps maybe? Well, that was pretty good, Dr. Yeah. Keith. I mean, <laughs> that, that's, you put that in a, in, in a really good context. I like that. Yeah, I think, I think once, you know, we talked about uh, at, at leadership, we measure metrics. Mm -hmm. You know, how are we doing as a church? And, you know, it seems like, well, gee, you know, is that really necessary? Well, 
yeah, I think if you're not really measuring things, if you're not keeping track of where you are, how do you know you're growing? So I think this is a very practical and easy way to to uh, uh, work as a guide mm -hmm. as to uh, help us grow spiritually. Because really, I mean, one thing I can say about the human condition and even somebody that's worked very hard a long time and loves to work and loves to help, we're all kind of lazy. <laughs> and uh, one area that I think it's really easy to kind of be lazy on, in rather, is in, in, in growing spiritually. And I think we alluded to it earlier. You know, some people, the extreme example is, okay, accepted Christ, done, check, right. check that box. But it's not checking boxes, but it's the way our brain's kind of designed, you mm -hmm. know. It, it's it's a challenge to stay on the path. We have somebody, uh, the enemy doesn't want us to right. to continue to grow and contribute and do great things for the kingdom, and and we need to we need to stay on the path, as Kevin says. You know, he'll say that so often visually too. He'll say, you know, I'm not perfect, you know, I'm I'm doing the best I can, and I'll be walking forward, and then I'll then I'll fall back. Sure. But the thing is, is I'm staying on the path. And that's what I wish for everybody, myself included. So I just want to stay on the path and move forward. Well, I think on that note, that's a great way to end. A great challenge to Thanks. just take one step at a time. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Alexander, for spending time with us. This you're was very a welcome. really good time. Thanks. Whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on your podcast app, make sure to subscribe to hear more. We'll see you next time.